to give you some examples of things that can get done with that data. Target, large US store, um, were, was able to spot the onset of the second trimester of pregnancy from your purchases at its store, okay, with a, with a 98% degree of accuracy. When you purchase things like from, you know, one of the loyalty cards, that card will, uh, will, uh, will record what you've been buying. If you have a large enough sample of data, you can then spot particular patterns, okay. A, you know, for example, you will start to purchase different ointments for your skin, you will start to purchase vitamin supplements, you'll start to change your diet, less alcohol, more, more fresh fruit and salads, you know, so these are all indicators that everybody does and if you can do that, if you can spot those appropriate patterns, you can then have a certain amount of predictive behaviour in advance. And that kind of data analytics and prediction is starting to drive large parts of what we do in society. It wasn't as simple as people were going out and buying baby clothes. No, it wasn't simple as that. It's the, it's the other patterns of purchases um, outside of that. So, you know, actually, there's a second one which is even more interesting in that regard. Um, Visa, at one point, um, and this has been contended, but at one point um, claimed an algorithm which would, with a shared credit history of two individuals who were a couple, and um, be able to predict divorce within two years, often before the individuals themselves had an awareness of it, because their spending patterns and behaviours had started to look like people who are orientating towards that happening. So that predictive ability of data analytics is a big part of what's called this the big data revolution. Um, and that b ability to predict behaviour. I think the issue here is about consumer protection. Ultimately, I don't think I don't think it's a reasonable thing to say because you didn't spend half a day reading this document that you that something bad's happened to you. That seems seems silly. I think, um, and I think companies, you know, need we need some form of legislation that does this. Actually, what's interesting in terms of the legislation framework that exists at present is we're undergoing a shift. We're undergoing a shift from the emphasis being uh, and responsibilities for these things lying with us to them lying with the data handlers to lying with big business. So the EU regulations that have started to emerge have started to push those things much more to the companies that provide these services. That's why you see that little pop-up screen saying, we use cookies, because those companies are now becoming responsible for telling you that. The danger is how we are going to make sense of that world, how when all of these terms and conditions, all of these issues are going to get pushed at us. Who made the most um, complicated one you've come across? I, that's a very good question and one I wouldn't want to necessarily be held to. Um, I was, I was surprised at how complex Google's were, um, given that Google's re-release was to simplify their terms and conditions. Uh, that surprised me. Um, I think all of the big six energy companies were shocking, and particularly given that they're meant to be a utility and they're meant to provide information that's accessible to all. There's been a range of research projects um, already which have presented kind of um, different representations of risks and exposures that you might have that you're agreeing to. And I think b building those and thinking of those in terms of kind of consumer protection models, which says, you know, you know, nutritional warnings are one example of this. These have been mapped over onto the digital. So where you can give simple indicators that what you're signing and what you're, what you're agreeing to. The analogy I do here is, every now and again, my credit card company sends me a little booklet about changes to their terms and conditions on their credit card. It's about 30 or 40 pages of the smallest text that's been printed so a 20-year-old can read it. And, but, you know, they're tight and there's loads of clauses and things. And we don't read that. But what we do read and we make sure we read are the kind of key fact sheets the one or two pages that, that were given, which says what the what the rate of the loan is, what the APR is, our consumer protection advises about these, and um, 
So that style of summary and key facts can be generated for these terms and conditions so we understand what they are. And part of my research is trying to understand what those are and how they could best be presented to us so that we understand them. And I think that matters more and more as more of what we do actually impacts all parts of our lives. Literatum is a tool of awareness, so you as an individual now have a tool to understand the complexity. And I think building those tools and exposing that hidden complexity of computing is a critical feature for us. Is that about awareness or is that about helping people get through these documents? The first thing that has to happen is, is certain things have to change. Some of those changes are not computer science. They are changes of governance, changes of regulation, changes of policy. Those things will only happen once people have an awareness of the issues that are involved. So in some ways this is a tool of awareness and provo provocation. This is a tool to make people aware that this is happening so that pub so the pu so publics generally can understand this and respond to it. Currently this isn't a talked about issue. So that's part of what that tool's, are, that, that tool's about. Um, other tools that we were exploring that you could build would be tools which would help present that information in a more comprehensible way, tools that would allow people to seek advice about things. Yeah. And those, I think, are part of a family of tools that you build in that space. One last question. This is like my fifth last question. Yeah. Have you ever run one of your grant proposals or one of your long emails through Smog? Well, when we wrote the paper up on this, um, what we actually did in the conclusion was we did two things. We ran our own paper through it and found that we were at a tertiary level of education. It was an academic paper and that seemed reasonable, but rather, um, yes, rather more frivolously perhaps, we also ran the terms and conditions of the conference uh, that we were submitting the proposal to and found that that was also a tertiary level of education, all of which seemed reasonable, but it's an obvious thing to feel that you need to do.